Yeah. Yeah, great. So we are recording now. And this is a study session of the Closure of Visual Tools group. We are a study group. It means we will learn together something. It is not a talk. It is not a lecture. Nobody here is expected to be an expert, even though there are a few very wise people in the group here. And we will mostly read into the ggplot book today. This book about ggplot and our package for data visualization with the grammar of graphics. And we are curious about ggplot as closure developers, as data people. And uh, we will just start learning today. Maybe it is the beginning of a series, maybe not. And uh, we will begin by introducing ourselves. So anybody here will say something if they wish about themselves and about how they relate to the topic. There are many visual people, many wise people in this team today. And yeah, so maybe Theodore, Theodore, would you like to begin and say something about yourself, about data visualization and so on? Yeah, uh, I can go first. My name is Theodore. Uh, I'm interested in, in programming. Uh, I've done work in software engineering, uh, in civil engineering and in data. So in in civil engineering, I've worked with data visualization, but not kind of doing the programming side, just using end user tools where you kind of zoom around and look at things. Uh, and I'm here because uh, I'd like to learn more about data visualization and to be able to think about how to present the things that uh, that I have to view, not only kind of view the the view the data the ways other people have decided. Thank you so much. And maybe later you say more because I know you have more to say. And yeah, um, maybe Thomas, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Thomas and I'm uh, a frontend developer and I did uh, do some um, data visualizations, mostly with uh, D3 and a little bit of FreeJS. Uh, so um, R is uh, quite new to me, except for some R uh, doing my studies, which has been a while. And uh, yeah, I'm really interested to see how, how the grammar of graphics works to, to build data visualizations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and by the way, this gallery of D3 plots in closure by Thomas has been guiding me recently. It is such a wonderful guide and thank you for this and the other visual things you've been creating. And yeah, uh, I'm Daniel. I am a community organizer at the Cycloge community. Uh, nowadays it is funded by Closure is Together for a short while. And yeah, I do meetings like that and, and some open source in the Cyclosh community. Uh, Andrew, hello. Hey, um, I'm Andrew. Uh, I've worked um, as a data scientist and data, data engineer variously throughout my career, done professional data work in, um, in Python, Scala, R, and Clojure. So, um, you know, it's been a few years since, uh, since I've done professional work with R, but my last job before my current job was at a shop that did data work primarily using R. Um, and that was my first experience using ggplot. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in this discussion because, you know, I, I found ggplot to, to be superior for kind of, you know, fundamental reasons um, to every other like data visualization library that I've like ever worked with. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I work primarily in Clojure now because that's my language of choice, but I'm particularly interested in the discussion today because, you know, I think that there, that there is a lot to learn from, from ggplot too, which I think <clears throat> implements the ideas in, uh, Wilkinson's grammar of graphics book, like better than, uh, than Vega and Vega Lite do. Um, and so, uh, you know, I know that those are the tools of choice and they work for a lot of things, but, you know, I think that there is, I think, you know, there this is, yeah, it, ggplot, there's a reason why ggplot2 is like, you know, the data visualization library for R and no one uses anything else. Um, so I'm excited to, uh, to, to, you know, explore more and see what we can learn from it. Yeah, thank you. And maybe just a bit later, maybe you will add a bit more about what the grammar of graphics is. 
would it be good? Yeah. Thanks. Mm. Yes, I uh, found some quotes from the book that I can read. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, hello, Kira. That's awesome. I'm excited. Hi. Yeah, I'm Kira. I think I've maybe met most of you. Um, yeah, I I have basically just big hopes and dreams for for closure and and data science. Um, I have been working on um, some like guides and tutorials and books and stuff like that, documenting closure's data science ecosystem. And I think think one of the biggest like holes is the visualization story. So right now it's possible to do data viz with some Vega light wrappers, um, Vega and Vega light wrappers in closure. And you can use, you could use e-charts or you could use anything. Basically you can embed anything, any sort of like, or D3, like existing JavaScript visualization thing in a closure notebook. But I think it's a bit ambitious, but I think it'd be really cool to implement the grammar of graphics in Clojure. Um, and so, yeah, I started talking to Daniel about this book, um, this ggplot book, because really it's just, it's an idea, it's it's a it's a grammar. And right now the only implementation is in R, but in theory, like there's no reason why we couldn't implement it too. And uh, it's like a long, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's like a pipe dream and, and I think, but I just think it'd be really cool. So anyway, I just, you know, got to start somewhere. So I figured, um, reading this book would be a good place to start and Daniel and I have been kind of been poking around a little bit and so I'm excited to to do it together um and yeah who knows whatever comes of it comes but I think I think it would be really cool to to get some sort of sort of legit like real kind of more robust um data viz library going uh for closure because I think that's that's kind of the last like big missing piece in my opinion Thank you so much. Yeah, and by the way, uh, anybody looking into this video should check out the videos by Kira, the workshops about Hanami, which is maybe one of the interesting ways to visualize stuff in Clojure nowadays. And maybe the best way to learn it is Kira's workshops, which are online on YouTube. And Tomasz, would you like to say something? Hi. Thank you, Tomasz Sullivan here. You may know me as a generic me. Uh, I'm an author of several libraries in Clojure uh, around mathematics and statistics, um, like past math and similar stuff. And in the past, I was uh, the co-author co of uh, Clojis, which is a R building library. Uh, probably we will use it today. Yes, Daniel? Or or not, do, do it, yeah. So, and uh, in the past I've made, uh, I created a library called uh, uh, CLJ, uh, Clojure Plot, CLJ Plot, Plot. And uh, I did it from the scratch and I made a lot of mistakes and errors uh, in the architecture of this library. And I, I hope to be back to, the, to this project and um, and I hope to learn how how to uh, organize the data flow in such libraries. And I think uh, yeah, the meeting today will be very valuable for me and for us to to, to figure out how, how to do this properly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, we could hear you. Maybe it was a bit like you were far away, but we could, we could hear you. And and it was it is great. And and I hope to ask you more uh, later this session. And and yeah, and CLJ plot hopefully is a topic of another study session. Uh, I think many of us haven't learned it fully. And even if you're saying that it is maybe not in its final stage, it is something worth learning, of course, and amazing. And yeah, hello, Jarrett. Uh, Jared, uh, would you like to say something? Hi, Daniel. It's good Hi. to see you. Uh, maybe I'm turning on my video. I don't like seeing myself, so I'll keep it off most of the time. But I'm Jared. I'm here. I'm a PhD student at a small university in the Midwest of the States. I've been around the world. I've taught most recently at a small university in Eswatini, Swaziland, the South Africa region. 
and I'm here studying and I'm very inspired by all of you. I've seen all the works you've done and I'm very impressed. So I'm here to be with the best. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think most of you know Jared from the chat in on another name. And it is so amazing for me to finally meet. Jared has been creating lots of stats and machine learning examples and exploring the libraries recently. And uh, would you like to say something more about yourself, Jared? Because um, No, yeah. thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. You, you make me feel good. Um, I, I try to put my input in and hopefully it's useful for somebody somewhere. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll share the screen now. And no, actually, should we say what the grammar of graphic is? And maybe, Andrew, would you like maybe to open this and say something about the idea? Sure, yeah. Oh, oh and by the, by the way, oh. hello, Dimit. Hello, our friend Dimit just joined. So thank you for joining, Dimit. Yeah, sorry for stopping you, Andrew. Do we want to uh, finish the intros before I dive in? Oh, maybe if you wish to meet, if you're hearing us, then it is just the perfect timing to say something if you wish about yourself. And otherwise, oh, maybe no. Yeah, so yeah, Andrew, uh, um, maybe, maybe it is a good time to begin the intro. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, the, the, you know, in the closure world, we frequently work with, um, you know, Vega and, and Vega Lite specifications, which are implementations of the idea of a grammar of graphics. Um, and the grammar of graphics comes from comes from the book by Leland Wilkinson. I have the second edition right here uh, called The Grammar of Graphics, which um, Wilkinson, I believe uh, he, I, I'm, I don't remember all the details of his background, but you know he he did some did some early work like in I think like the in like the eighties the eighties and nineties on statistical computing and data visualization um, when it, access to graphical user interfaces was still relatively new uh, in the world of personal computing. I believe his his company was acquired by SPSS, um, the statistical like um, soft software software company, and he was I think he was he was chief scientist there. Um, and then eventually worked at uh, H2O AI um, before the before the end of his end of his career. Um, I think he passed away uh, several years ago. Um, but this book is basically like kind of like his magnum opus. Um, it you know kind of summarizes what he learned, you know, um, and has a lot of lessons that I think need to be relearned over and over again uh, by people working with like data visualization tools based on based on my experience. But you know the important thing for our discussion today, right, is that the this is the book that is the is the is the common parent basically of gg ggplot2 in r um, which is an implementation in r of the of the concepts from this book and also the tools that some of us in the closure ecosystem might be more familiar with with you know vega and uh and, and vega light but um you know i think like the reason why this book is important i think is right on page two uh uh so it's uh it's it's uh it's like pretty I think this is this is this is the quote that like leapt out at me when I was uh you know first first reading the book and um you know uh I've read almost the entire first half of it um which is about the syntax of how to compose charts from more fundamental elements. Um so he says here quote we often call graphics charts from Greek which is in Greek, so I can't read it, uh, or Latin, or Latin charta, a leaf of paper or papyrus. Uh, there are pie charts, bar charts, line charts, and so on. This book shuns chart typologies. For one thing, charts are usually instances of much more general objects. Once we understand that a pie is a divided bar in polar coordinates, we can construct other polar graphics that are less well known. We will also come to realize why a histogram is not a bar chart and why many other graphics that look similar nevertheless have different grammars. There's, a there's also a practical reason for shunning chart typology. If we, endeavor, if we endeavor to develop a charting instead of a graphing program, we will accomplish two things. First, we will inevitably will offer fewer charts than people want. Second, our package will have no deep structure. Our computer program will be unnecessarily complex because we will fail to reuse objects or routines that function similarly in different charts. Uh, and, so, and we will have no way to add new charts to our system without generating complex new code. 
elegant design requires us to think about a theory of graphics, not charts. And so like the reason why that that passage is important is because like he's trying to like decompose the basic charts that we're all familiar with, like the bar chart, line plot, you know, time series, whatever, into, you know, the more fundamental like things like axes, scales, uh, you know, uh, uh, hold on, I'm looking at the table of contents. So table of contents basically, right. So, you know, scale, scales, geometry, coordinates, facets, guides, these, these types of things. These are the, these are in, 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 according to the theory laid out in this book, these are the, 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 um, the things that like all of the other kind of day-to-day -day charts that we see and interact with are basically like special cases of, they're just different ways of combining them. And he offers a formal algebra for how to combine these constituents, el th these constituent elements across different chart types in a, in a coherent and consistent way. Um, and like, I think that like, our the R library ggplot like is is something that like much more directly implements the algebra that's described in this book than something like vega light um and i think like that we can we can maybe um we can maybe pause and compare how you would implement the same plots in like ggplot2 once we've gotten a little bit more familiar with ggplot for those who are new to it but i think like if we if we look at like some examples of like you know like the miles per gallon data set or whatever else like and compare what the vega light specification looks like versus what the ggplot uh command to produce the same plot would be i think it'll reveal like the the the, the difference between ggplot and like what we're what we're what we're used to and 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 go to why why i think like ggplot as a library connects to to this book This is great. And it is great that you're mentioning those concepts because yes, these are the words that ggplot, the ggplot book actually says. And, and I, I was kind of intimidated by all of it, but in the last few days, I learned that the ggplot book and ggplot itself, they are very clear about the notions. Actually, yes, there are quite a few notions there but the notions are simple and clear and we just learn to compose them. It may take some time, maybe not everything clarifies today, but yes, it can clarify. And um, yeah, that is great. Thank you, Andrew. Any other comment about the grammar of graphics, about the ideas uh, broadly before we dive into ggplot? I just I think, think this is really, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think I'm gonna say the same thing. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I, I'm really excited. Uh, I have uh, tried ggplot2 for like uh, f 40 minutes today and never before and uh, a bit of Vega Vega light previously and uh, I kind of have this gut feeling that you're right, but I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, I also noticed that what you're saying about an, an alg algebra that composes with operations uh, really kind of uh, gets me thinking about how to do this well in, in Clojure because there are instances of of problems where I see that kind of a, a closure solution is really, really nice. Uh, uh, for instance, what Emmy has been able to do uh, for computer uh, algebra systems. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to see see where we're where we'll end up. That's gonna be great. Great, thank you. So I'll share the screen now. And before we start thinking about ggplot and all that, I think we'll just practice using it a little bit from closure, just so that we know it can be done. And maybe Tomas, in a moment, you will say more about it if you if you think there is more to say. So I'll share the screen briefly. I think you see the browser and the the editor with some code. Yeah, things are moving in a moment. It will clarify, right? So, right. So we have the editor here and we can write closure code. It is a closure namespace. And in this session, we'll assume that some closure is known to, uh, to us. And, and yeah, so 
let us first see that we can use ggplot from within Clojure and then let us kind of discuss what we are seeing. So um, yeah, uh, we we have Clojure here and we can use it uh, from Clojure. It is a way to run R code from Clojure. Clojure communicates with an R session. So right, you can do some arithmetic and get a result, right? So you compute a piece of R code and there are a few ways to do it. So let us compute a piece of closure, sorry, a piece of R code from within closure. And this R code will be some data visualization code. And I think most of you did say you have looked into ggplot, so so should be a little bit familiar. So uh, yeah, so first to do that, we need to uh, bring the ggplot library to the, the R runtime, right? So in R, you would say library, and uh, in Clojure, we may say something like that, ggplot. So now uh, ggplot2 is loaded to the R runtime we are connected to from within Clojure. And now we can do something like ggplot2, sorry, ggplot2 and pass a data set to it. And the ggplot R package itself has a few, uh, a few uh, uh, data sets in the package. So maybe, yeah, actually maybe, maybe let us begin by one of them, which is the mpg data set. Uh, so yeah, what is this? Right, so it is uh, a table, as they call it, which is like a table or a data frame with a nice API uh, of data about cars. It's part of the ggplot package and we we'll use it for plotting. So you can pass the data set or the table to the ggplot call, and then you need to specify the mapping, mapping of aesthetics, which maps data columns to uh, visual aesthetics. So the aesthetics are maybe that the X axis is defined by the city Y column and the Y axis is defined by the HW Y column. And maybe the color is defined by the year. So here we create a ggplot object and we will add something to it. The geometry, geom point for a chart of points for a scatter plot. Right? And I put the parentheses just for convenience. So what is this? I compute this and it fails. Oh, right, the function is called ggplot, not ggplot2. So, uh, oh, am I not in the right namespace? Oh, sorry, I should load this namespace and try again. Is it stuck? Not stuck. Oh, right, so the problem is that uh, we don't, Right, that's the point. When you print a plot in R, it is directed to the graphic device. And now, since we are running R from within Clojure, we don't have the graphic device visible. So we need to turn this plot into something we can visualize from Clojure. So we have this plotting namespace. And, and we may turn the plot into an image, for example, that we can see in Clojure. And now I sent it to the browser with one of our tools, the clay tool, and you see a plot we, we've created. In this case, it is an, like a, a bitmap image. You can also turn it into SVG. Then it will, oh, and then you should say, yeah, this is, please view this as HTML. So let us not bother about all these details. SVG would look sharp, more sharp, of course, but 
let us use a buffer, with buffer image for simplicity, right? So you can see the plot. So what we did in this workflow is from within the closure namespace, we, uh, commun we communicated with an R session. And in this R session, we did load the ggplot library and did some ggplot computation that created a plot object and we turned it into an image and viewed that image from a closure data visualization tool. So that's a basic workflow. And maybe in a moment we'll see just a little more, just to have a taste of what we have here. Uh, any any comments about this? Any, any thoughts? Daniel, you're using like quotes, our quotes. Doesn't right. it, however you say closure, however you say that, doesn't it have some kind of um, lispy? representation? Yeah, thank you, thank you. So yes, so closure the, uh, the closure library for running our code from closure or for communicating communicating with our closure can do that as well. It can have some, it can work with expressions. Thank you. So let us do that. And, and there is a, a nice tutorial about it. Uh, and I, I think will not see all the diversity of what you can do, we'll have a little taste of it. So yes, you can create closure expressions that will be converted to our code. And you can also include closure data in your closure expressions that will be converted to our code. So let us see that. So this data set, the MPG data set, we also have it in closure. Uh, it is in the metamorph library. So we have this uh, toy data ggplot namespace with a few of the ggplot packages and one of them with a few of the ggplot datasets. And one of them is this MPG dataset. So you see, here it is again, is a closure dataset this time. So now what you see printed is a closure dataset, right? Of the same data. And yes, we can pass it to closure functions which are wrapping our functions. Let us do that. To do that, we need to require ggplot as a closure namespace. So you can do it like, like that, for example, with an alias gg, if you wish. So now you have gg, ggplot, this, is a closure function, which is wrapping the R function. This is one way to, to do it. You can also work with symbols, but I think uh, it will be nice to see this way where you actually work with functions, right? So we are creating a ggplot plot and we're passing the argument of aesthetics. And this argument you create by calling the AES function, which is another function in this namespace and you have a way to pass the other details in an equivalent way to what we did in the R code. Right. And then we need to add, you see this plus symbol. So we need to add another R object. So we have this convenience function R plus, which is for adding values on the R side of adding R object. And the things the thing we are adding is gd slash geom point without any arguments at the moment. So this is creating an R object. And again, this R object can be turned into, oh, sorry, we need to run to evaluate it through R. Now it creates an R object, which is the plot. And now we can turn this object into an image. And we see the same, right? So it is another flavor of doing it. And there are some ways in between these two ways we saw here, where one of them was just R code as a string, and the other was actually calling closure functions and closure data, where the R runtime is communicating with it uh, uh, behind the scenes. And there are other flavors, uh, like uh, in, uh, other variations of it. 
and maybe Tomas has some comments about it, uh, about other ways to do it, and about the idea behind this mode of interrupt. And or oh, maybe any maybe, any maybe not maybe not now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have more time to talk about it in the future. Yeah. So so great. So that was a little taste of calling ggplot from within closure. Let us do just another thing. And I think we just do it briefly. I, uh, Kira and I, we created a function for representing a ggplot plot as a closure data structure. And so Clojisa, the general interop library, it does have ways of converting are objects to closure data. But sometimes some of those object-oriented layers of our objects are not con converted to closure data out of the box. So some ad hoc tricks are needed to make sure you can actually represent it as a closure data structure, which is something we like to do in closure, right? So we did write a function to, to make sure you can take a ggplot object and turn it into a closure data structure. Let us just see how it looks. Uh, yeah, so, oh, right, oh, yeah. Uh, should I send it to the browser maybe to see? Uh, oh, not the image, of course, right. Yeah, and maybe I'll just dissoch the data set itself. Sorry. Just remove some part, which is a bit, a bit boring at the moment. So you see, you have this nested map, which is not too big in, in this case, but could be more complicated in other cases. And this is repre representing the, the R object, which is the plot before before you actually render it, before you take care, before, sorry, R takes care of actually drawing the object. It has a certain data representation. And there is a nice R package called ggtrace that does similar things in R for certain intermediate steps in the ggplot rendering process. So you can see actually how ggplot converts this structure to other intermediate steps till it becomes the plot. And I think we can learn from these data structures and actually introspect what we are doing. And maybe later today we'll enjoy this as a tool, maybe not today. Um, but let us just know that we can do it. And also let's, let us know that the book, the ggplot book that will now open, has a chapter called Internals of ggplot, which is a very brief but detailed description of the data transformation process that basically takes a data structure of this kind and with actually with the data set itself that we remove now, right? And actually converts it step by step into the actual plot to be drawn. And you can see in this very brief but detailed chapter of the internals, you can see all the concepts in action the scales and the, the guides and all of them, they appear here. And, and it just tells us where things are handled. And I think we will, we hopefully, maybe not today, but one day should spend some time with this chapter 19. So yeah, so now we just know what we can do. And we have a little taste of this plotting idea. And, and maybe just briefly, uh, it is not today's topic, but let us say, kind of how ggplot is different from other ways we like to use for plotting in closure. So some of you did mention Vega Light and Hanami, and, and there is some relationship between these different ways of grammar of graphic data visualization 
And the difference is something we care about. And that is why we're here today, I think. And so does anybody wish to say anything about difference? It is maybe not a long discussion, but just to kind of put things in context about, you know, in your, in your view, in your experience, how this is maybe a bit different from Vega Light, which we often use. Andrew? Yeah, could you pull up those internals again, real oh. quick? I think I think because I think this is I think this is actually very instructive, right? Um, yeah, and I'm putting the link in the yeah. Chat. Well, I mean, I don't mean the um the chapter. I meant the actual the oh, the, yeah. the plot specification that oh. you displayed on your screen uh, just a few minutes ago. Right. Yeah. So this is the, yeah, you see it now, right? Yeah. 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 So I think like we don't have a one-to-one -one comparison because we don't have like the exact equivalent of the Vega light version of this plot here. But like in my experience, like you don't get the, um, the, the operators, right. That you use in GG plot, like the plus, you know, operator that is used to combine aspects. Um, right. Like when you're working with Vega light, um, and even its closure wrappers, um, which are designed to like facilitate higher level interactions, right? Like you're usually basically just just constructing what's you know on the left side of the screen here directly to to create like a Vega Light plot, right? Like Vega Light doesn't give you the um, the compositional things that ggplot2 does, and so basically it, you rather than like using the combining operators that are part of like ggplot's API you just end up constructing the specification directly, even though, you know, under the hood, ggplot2 is producing this, the, the, the same, a specification that looks fairly familiar to someone who's worked with Vega Light a, a fair bit. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm obviously no expert in the internals of ggplot2, and it's been several years since I worked, worked with it on a consistent basis. But, you know, just like looking at like the, the way that this, that the, the plot is specified, through this like it, it looks quite familiar to me having having worked with vega light but nevertheless like i find the way that ggplot2 allows you to construct this specification more intuitive than just building it directly which is what i frequently find i have to do um when i'm working with vega light on a day-to-day -day basis yeah i think that's the magic of ggplot is like the the interface because yeah like I I find the same thing like when I'm working with Vega Vega Light, I'm often just pretty quickly end up needing to drop in and like write JSON or Eden or whatever. It's like you're manually you really have to understand the internals and the fundamentals of how it works to be able to write the specs that you want if you want to do anything beyond like a really simple bar chart or scatter plot or something like that. And so I I feel like it kind of defeats the purpose. It's like it's a really it's a cool library and it's great, but it's like if you have to understand it inside and out, like what if you're not a software engineer or whatever, you know, what if you're just a like, not just a data person, but if you don't, if you don't want to go into that rabbit hole, I think that's the whole thing is like, um, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's stuff is obviously an abstraction. Like it's obviously much a higher level than, um, D3, which I, which it uses under the hood, but it's, it's still not super abstract. Like you, you're getting into the nitty gritty of like axes and layers and scales. And it's like, I don't want to care about like the nuances between scales and axes and marks and encodings. And it's like, I just want to tell you, I want a line or I want a point. And that's, that's what I find cool. And that's what I want to, that's what I want to make happen for closure is, is have that like magic behind the scenes translation between a, like a, a very friendly, you know, here's my data and I want a line here and I want a, a bar there and I want a point there. And then convert that into this like Eden or JSON or whatever, but never have to actually like go manually fiddle with it to get what you want. Um, that's the dream. Yeah. Well, I think that the, also the, 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 the nice thing about ggplot too, from, you know, from, and I need to find like a more complex example that, that shows this is that like, if you do need to like enhance, like some aspect of it like say like you want to like 
customize the marks on the axes, but nothing else, right? Like you can, you can still use the same operators to like basically flesh out like the customization that you want to apply to that part of the plot while leaving the other details like kind of like unchanged. So it's, it's, you know, it allows for kind of um, incremental, uh, like incremental specification or like incremental specificity where you you're fleshing out the parts of the plot that you care about while leaving the other stuff alone uh without sacrificing any of the compositional power of like the algebra and the operators you know i think is like is like that's like one of the things that i think you know gg ggplot2 does better than like any other library that i've worked with is um you know allowing me control over the fine-grained details when I need to without like making me worry about it all the time. It's a really good way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, maybe let us mention a few other differences between ggplot and 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 Vega Light and Hanami, the things we often use in closure. So one of them is that ggplot acts in the backend. Right? You are in our runtime. You have all your statistical computing and you just compose things over there. And then you plot. And when you draw a histogram in Vega Light, you actually bin the values on the browser side, which is different, right? And binning for a histogram is one example, but you may have other statistical summaries which are more essential to be done in the backend. So that is another difference. And another one is more about, you know, the net nature of the API. ggplot is about functions, creating objects. And in Clojure, that's maybe not our favorite way to, to work. Sometimes we don't like that things are hidden from us, right? Vega Light makes everything declarative and visible. Hanami, which is a way to write Vega Light more briefly, also makes things very much visible, just as plain data. ggplot does hide the details. We needed to dig in in order to take them out. And if you watch the talk of uh, Jun Cho, the person who did the ggtrace R package, then they say the same. They say, yeah, we want to look inside. And ggplot is hiding from us. And if we are thinking about a ggplot-like solution in Clojure, maybe it will be more open, more visible, like more kind of structured around data structures in a clear way. So, right, we, we are not committed to everything it brings, right? And But yeah, and of course, we can enjoy functions and the safety they bring, right? Just, you know, when you call a function, you can check the arguments are okay. And, and so some of it might be useful, but maybe eventually we end up with something which is more similar to Hanami, at least in my hope. And I think uh, unless there are any other comments about this, maybe all of this belongs to another day uh, when we discuss uh, more about our plans. And now, yeah, uh, any other comments? Oh, Theodore. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering specifically about the, uh, uh, is it all just data or is it objects? Uh, the internal representation of both uh, write it router objects and uh, MA values is a custom type. So it's a def type or something under the, but you can ask for a data representation. Yeah. So uh, is it possible to kind of get the benefits of, of both? Or do we kind of have to choose either to just have plain maps or to do something really object oriented? Are you talking about our plans in Clojure or about ggplot itself? Yeah, I, I'm kind of trying to picture how a Clojure, uh, Clojure flavored ggplot uh, would, would look. Yeah, so maybe for today, all we can say is, yes, these are the questions we should ask and let us keep them for maybe next week. But, but let us first maybe study ggplot, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, should we? Oh. Thomas. Yeah, I have maybe like a more general question about our ggplot because I 
I started like using it just the first time a couple of days ago. And one thing that I found a bit confusing about the API is the, is the use of the term aesthetics, because for me, the term is more like something decorative or something. And when I was mapping like the aesthetics of the X value to something, it just didn't make sense for me. And I'm wondering like, is it, is it similar for other people? Is it a weird term? Or do I just have the wrong understanding of what an aesthetic actually is? Yeah. So yeah, no, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I guess I don't have much to say, just that I agree. Like I found it, it's used differently than you might typically for sure. Like, yeah, it's, it's some, it's more akin to like, like what other, a lot of other viz libraries called like encoding or, mm -hmm. or marks or stuff like that. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's not strictly like like the aesthetic appearance of the thing. It's actually giving you details about how you encode like data as like marks or or whatever. So I thought it wasn't super intuitive to me either. Yeah, the aesthetics thing is directly from chapter 10 of the grammar of graphics. Like like um Wilkinson Wilkinson is 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 I think intentionally using the term differently than the way it's 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 conventionally used. Um, yeah. So I think he, I'll just quote from the beginning of the chapter here. Um, we have chosen the name aesthetics to describe an object in our graphical system because of its original connotations and because the modern word perception is subjective rather than objective. Perception re refers to the perceiver rather than the object. Aesthetics turn graphs into graphics so that they are perceivable but they are not the perceptions themselves. A modern psychologist would likely call aesthetics in this sense, stimuli aspects or features, but those words are less precise for our purposes. Um, the preceding chapters have discussed the components of the system for producing graphs, but up to this point, we have nothing to show. Without aesthetics, graphs are invisible, silent, indeed imperceptible. Aesthetics are functions that govern how a graph is represented as a visible or otherwise perceivable graphic. Um, and I think it's worth noting, I think that um, Wilkinson's background originally is in psychology. Uh, th that mm -hmm. was his PhD training was in was in psychology and uh, did quantitative research as a, as a psychologist um, before like moving into statistical computing and, and data visualization. So that may be part of the reason why. This is great. Yeah, and by the way, the name of the argument is mapping. So your mapping is an aesthetic object for some reason. That's the way it is in ggplot. Yeah. Um, great. So maybe what we can do now, we have a little more than half an hour to the official time. Maybe what we can do now is look over the book and maybe see what we have inside and maybe pick one chapter and, and kind of uh, spend some time with it. And, and then... At the end, we can decide, should we have more sessions like this? Should, you know, or any other format that will help us keep going. And so uh, should I share the book, share the screen with the book or maybe another person? Um, I can share, oh, but if anybody wishes, then yeah, I can share. Yeah, so. So, right, so this is the, the, the ggplot book by Wickham and Navarro and Pedersen. And I think we'll just briefly go through the chapters. And you see there is an introduction, which is, will not be surprising, I think, to anybody who has used ggplot a little bit. And, and, and some plot examples. And, and then... Uh, things which are kind of similar to what we've seen and and then there are the there is the layer chapter layers chapter but yeah maybe before that let us spend some time with this you see what we're doing here is passing the same mpg data set of cars and defining the aesthetics just the x and y and saying geom point for a, a point plot, uh, scatter plot, right? And also saying plus geom smooth. And then we just get this smooth uh, 
line, smooth curve line for free without specifying anything. You see there are some defaults in action and we could change the, we could override the defaults. And maybe that's the point that you can add high level stuff, which is computed in your statistical computing runtime in R and, and this stuff has some decent defaults that seem to be working. Okay? And, and then you can kind of override them and change the behavior. And yeah, so, so uh, yeah, if you browse through ggplot galleries, you'll see what, you know, the, the kind of the diversity of things you can do there. And, and then we have the layers part with many concepts introduced. Maybe let us just briefly look into a few of them. So the geoms, geoms are those things we were adding, geometrical layers, right? And some of them are individual geoms, which means you have one element per row in your data, like we had in a scatter plot. Every row in your data set will be a point in your scatter plot, in your geom point, right? So there are many things like a bar chart and a point chart and many things like that, which are all individual geoms, right? With, with a relationship between visual elements and rows in your data set. And there are collective geoms where you have a certain summary, like that smooth curve we saw, right? Where you have a certain summary. There is no clear relationship between visual elements and rows in your data because something has been summarized. And, and yeah, and then another notion which is presented here is grouping, where here, for example, you may say, yeah, first here we, we still have individual geoms in this example, like point chart and a line chart, but you're saying, yeah, please group by subject, which is one of your columns in your data set. And then things are, are created per group. So a line chart is created per group. So the dots are connected separately for each of the group, which are the subjects of this, this uh, data set of boys. And and then uh, when you uh, when you you know add a smoothing like a collective job with some summary, it does matter whether you're grouping or not. And and there are certain combinations of this. And I'm just skipping this briefly so you see box plot is another way of creating a collective geom, which is a certain summary representing the, the variation of data. And, and you have things like that. So I'm just browsing through it so that we see that is here. And maybe we come back in a moment. And so, so far what we have seen are individual geoms, collective geoms, and grouping. Well, you can say things are kind of computed in separately per group. And yeah, so so I'm trying to kind of read very briefly so that we kind of see the whole book and then we, we come back if it makes sense. But please stop me if there is something that you feel we should kind of spend more time with. And right, so again, the idea is that these things we are adding with a plus sign, with a plus operator, these things we are adding are called layers. And where, you know, earlier we saw the data representation of a plot. So you see we, it had those layers, which were a list of things. In that case, it was just one thing in that list of layers, but you may have more if you are adding more with a plus sign. Right? So geoms are certain are types of layers, right? But you may also add uh, statistical co computations, and and you know they they may compute all all kinds of stuff over the 
the, the data and kind of make available more computed uh, values that you can act on. And, and uh, when you create a histogram, this is an example of this kind. And a box plot is another example of this kind where there is some statistical computation behind that happens before plotting. So geom box plot that we saw earlier actually has some statistical computation happening behind the scenes by default. And a histogram also has some statistical computation, you know, binning the values and counting the values and bins. So these things are happening here behind the scenes without us saying stat something, but essentially you have a statistic, uh, a, a stat layer uh, uh, in in your data flow, and and later we'll see that more explicitly. So there are those ideas of different statistical summaries, like uh, you know density approximation and so on, and. So I'm, I'm skipping, and yeah, and uh, there is a chapter of, about geographical maps that we'll skip, and about visualizing networks that we'll skip, and and more details about what you can do with a plot, with annotations, and so on, and arranging a few plots in a rectangle, some, somehow laying them out together. So that is the layers part of the book that we may come back to. And then there is the scales part of the book, and scale is one of those notions from the grammar of graphics book that Andrew mentioned. And, and maybe, you know, I think it deserves the time. So, right, you may say, for example, scale, scale x log, so that you would use the log scale for your x axis, right? And this does not mean we uh, tr transform all the, we simply transform the X values by log, it is not the same, right? Because the numbers we see at the bottom of the axis, the labels of the axis would remain in a log scale. Uh, I'm looking for the example of log scale. Oops, sorry. Oh, here is a good example. So you see, we have one plot on the left and one plot on the right. No, no, not a good example, sorry. Oh. Yeah, actually, may, maybe let us let us make a log plot because it is an important point, and it is actually kind of a point that hopefully makes it clear why we need a notion like a scale. And then, yeah, let me maybe let us look into an example and then continue. Right, so we had this plot. So, right, we had this plot. I think it is. We can have oh, sorry, this one. So this in, it is an example of a plot where we could have log scale of maybe the y-axis, right? So we can do something like, plus gg scale y log. And then what happens? is that the spacing between the labels on the, the y-axis has changed, but the labels remain. 40 is still 40, but 40 and 30 are closer than 30 and 20 because we use log state, right? So we did not transform the values and forgot all about the original values. We still, we still speak the language of the previous values. We just space them differently. So that's the notion of a scale. And, and there is also the notion of a guide, which is kind of related. So it is like just to be mentioned at this moment so that we know that these notions are simple and clear 
but they are not clear to us yet. We should learn them. So we have a whole chapter in the book about scales, like this, um, these few uh, sections. And then there is the part about the grammar. And this part does clarify a few things because it says that uh, um, it, it kind of shows you know, the roles of the different notions in our function calls, right? So, so maybe this one is worth spending time with and, and because it is kind of, kind of uh, uh, beginning to look like, like a speck of what ggplot is about. So maybe, maybe this one we could pick today and spend some time with. And, and here also it is clarifying the notions of scales and guides and uh, in a very kind of clear way. But, and, and so this part does deserve our time, maybe, uh, maybe today, maybe next time. And, and coordinate systems are yet another, yet another notion where you can flip the, the X and Y coordinates and so on. You can do these, these transformations, which are not exactly like scales, they are another thing. And, and the, there is a collection of these as well. So it has this part of the book. And facets are about you know, uh, using some of our variables to organize some sub subplots uh, se separately so that we can kind of have a grid of plots. Uh, and, uh, and it is yet another notion. And, and themes. Uh, we may care about as well. We see some nice colors. And then we get to advanced topics. And of, of the advanced topics, there is this part about programming and 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 uh I think yeah, I did skip something important. Maybe I should come back in a moment, but um I think of the advanced topics, the internals is the one we should really care about because it really kind of tells the whole story. Really, you see, it says mostly conceptually it divides the plotting process into two steps, build and G table. And it specifies what each of these steps does. So build creates a new data structure with some transformation of our data, which is Kind of more prepared for a plot, but not all transformations happen in the build stage. Some do happen in the G table stage. And then it is already all about the graphics, about making it making it a plot. And so if we implement something like ggplot, I think we should spend really our time in this chapter 19. And maybe I'll just come back to the grammar and then maybe we pick a part and dive into it. And yeah, so th this is the part that does clarify a lot. Right? So you remember Geon Point, right? Geon Point was about, you know, creating a scatter plot, you know, and, and actually Geon Point is a special case of a layer, as we said. And specifying a layer is about specifying these five things. Geon Point simply has you know, default values for these five things that you can override, right? So the mapping is null by default, but you may specify a mapping for a geom point. If you specify it, it will override the uh, top level mapping you have specified while creating the plot, right? So you may specify a mapping. You may specify a data set that will override the top level data set of the plot. You may specify a geom, but by default, it is just point. You may specify some statistic, but by default, it does nothing. And you may specify a position that we haven't discussed. We should find it probably somewhere in the layers or scales chapter. It's another notion that yeah, you should care about. And in geom point, it is the, the generate as well. So you see any layer, any layer is just about specifying these five things and basically overriding the value that 
could have been specified in the top level. So conceptually, you have a top level where you specify the details and you have layers where each layer may have its own defaults for these five things and may also override them on the user side by saying, yeah, I'm defining a geom point with this mapping and that, that statistic and so on. So I think this part does clarify a lot. And, and then starting to think like that, you may realize, yeah, maybe for some time, we may try to program ggplot this way, the more detailed way, and kind of just make this more visible to us about you know these additional details, and then come back to those functions that simply have more defaults, right? So, so that was an attempt to kind of quickly read all over the book, and now we can pick apart and dive into it, if you wish. We have 15 minutes to the official time, and some of you may wish to stay. Uh, any comments so far? Any thoughts about you know, about the mode of this session? Should we keep going this way? Should we do anything differently? Uh, should we have another time next week? Uh, and any thought like that? What would make us actually learn ggplot? Daniel, my question would be, uh, to what end are we learning ggplot? Because I think it has to do with the end of interopping in closure. And is that the idea we want to perpetually interop with R? Or is it so we have an idea of ggplot's inner working and we will then build out some kind of library of our own that you know is a quasi ggplot? Is that the idea? I don't know to what end this is because I, you know, I know Gigi plots a little bit. I've used Vega with Hanami and they're, they're, they're all nice. Uh, they all have their pros and cons. So to what end is, are we looking at here? So I think both Tomas and Kira may have an answer for why we're learning Gigi plot. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, I've, I assume everyone's here for a slightly different reason, but yeah, I'm like, I'm interested in actually implementing this in closure. Um, I don't know how realistic that is. Like someday I'll have to get a real job, but for now I have some time to work on open source, um, things and like, um, yeah, I got a little bit of funding from closures together. And so I am like, this may be like the only time in my life when I actually have time to do a project like this. And so I kind of want to take advantage and, uh, yeah, and maybe, and you know, maybe we'll quickly realize that's just like a totally crazy idea and it's never going to work. But um, yeah, that's what that's what that's what kicked this off. I just figured, you know, kind of learning the underlying philosophy is a reasonable place to start before you start slinging code. From my side, uh, I definitely interested to, to to create a library. Because I in the past I did one uh, CLG plot, and I was gonna uh, say yeah, but uh, yeah, I failed in the in the API actually, and I, at, the, at the can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just I don't I wouldn't call it a failure. I think it was. Okay. I think that's too harsh. It was a it's a great library. I was I was even gonna say like I think CLJ plot is a really good starting point um yeah yeah you you have there a lot of primitives and then drawing d d done that's but the but, the a but the api is a totally yeah the trash to to to, to throw to, to replace with anything uh, useful so i think uh, we can join in forces if you want kira and yeah. uh, let's let's uh, let's uh, see how the ggplot2 is uh, created and how the api how the data flow is uh, That's so exciting. Done, done there yeah so That's i'm really i'm highly interested in it yeah well i think um, i think mm -hmm. clj plots are really really good place to start cuz like i yeah I, i've done a lot of front end stuff and svg stuff and i hate it and so but i think there's i think there's two there's like many different layers you know there's like the 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 ui like the actual api that users are going to be typing in and then there's the kind of like conversion to the data structures and then there's rendering those data structures as graphics on an html page and that's the part that clj plot already kind of does really well and so i think it's um I think it's a really good 
it's a good building block for sure. And, and yeah, I would love to, to, you know, work more together and anyway, yeah, I know, I know we'll, well, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of each other around, around the internet, but I don't know, this is, I feel like probably it's not going to work, but I'm trying to be, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic right now. So we'll see. In theory, but so yeah, it's probably not going to work. Why? It seems like uh, Tomas has a very nice library. I've been using some as even Daniel just showed, you know, right off the back with his little pinky. He's able to pop just, up these plots that are beautiful. Like what, what, what are some stumbling blocks? Just the time, just the time. I think it's, you know, I think I might, I might run out of money before I, before I finish the, uh, the project and have to get a real job. And then there's just no time, but, um, but for now it's, uh, but for now it's fun. It's super fun getting a chance to work on all this stuff. And, and yeah, and I would love to see it like Daniel was saying, like moving as much of the processing as we can to the the JVM side is really the goal. Cause right now, like he was saying, a lot of the graphs do some non-trivial lifting on the JavaScript end, which is just like prohibitively slow and, and messy. Um, and so that's what CLJ plot implements really nicely is like doing all of the crunching and all of the manipulation and everything in closure, like proper on the JVM. And then just sending as little information as possible to the browser is kind of the dream. I'm um, sorry, I have like a little hand. I, I feel like I'm rambling. Sorry, are you trying to say something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just adding sorry to the, that. just adding to the ambition, right? Like one of the nice things about like having like the the um the grammar separate from the specification, separate from the rendering, as you just described, mm -hmm. right, is the potential of rendering to multiple different targets, right? Primarily, all of our right. work targets the browser because that's the um, because that's the the environment where a lot of our computational notebooks are. I mean, I use Clerk basically every day, um, you know, uh, and it's a it's a great it's a great library. But you know, like uh, there are potential other rendering targets, right? Like um, you know, Humble UI is ma maturing more and more, right? It's a platform for desktop applications with closure on the JVM, you know. And if you if you implement the specification as a data structure you know, in a manner analogous to the internals of ggplot or Vega Lite, you could imagine rendering it using Humble UI, right? And then you, if you have ggplot written in an implementation independent way, you could, you know, use the same specification and render it as part of a desktop data visualization app written using Humble UI, which would be, I think that's like, to me, that's the ideal case, right? And that's, I think that that's, part of the power of the specification of the grammar of graphics is that like it makes that kind of separation easy um and i think that we do have the um the stuff in the closure world to, to do something like this um i think kira you're right though it's just like the time and the, and the work necessary to do it it's just hard to get people to pay money for this kind of stuff it's like you know it's like the equivalent of basic research in science it's like just trust me just give me all your money and then maybe in like three years i'll have something that's worth it maybe not though but you know it'll be it'll be fun for me so can i please have some money um i'm just not very good at selling it and there's not really there's some there's some grants and stuff but there's not i don't know maybe there are i just don't know i don't know how to make money doing this but for now i just i stopped caring about that and i'm doing it anyway but um i don't know how sustainable that is in the long run <laughs> Yeah, gonna move to Mexico or something. We have ten minutes to the official time, and it is kind of tempting to ask: Should we just continue this discussion of where we're going, of what we wish to do, or should we actually study something about GD plots, like look into a few plots or dive into the data structure? Which one do we prefer? And should we have another session? in a week or two, Theodore? I mean, I, I'm excited about all of this, but if, if I were to kind of suggest something, I would uh, like to just jump into REPL and, and try to implement some of this. Just like start a ggplot namespace and see if we can get some of the operations going. Yeah. Uh would you like me to share the screen or maybe anybody else and, and play with it? Or should maybe, because we have just a few minutes, then maybe this part belongs to after the official time, after maybe somebody may need to leave and then we can kind of open a REPL and just stay and and, and write some stuff if it makes sense, Theodore, right? And um, so, yeah, because, yeah, we just have seven minutes to the official time and I don't know if anybody needs to leave, but maybe we can- I, I will be leaving. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so so yeah, so maybe it makes sense to kind of use this time to discuss. First, yeah, I think we'll keep going with reading the book and, and maybe because I'm reading, maybe I should try to summarize some parts, but we can also have sessions with just spending more time with actually with the book. And and uh, should we set something next week or in two weeks? We can also chat about it offline. So if anybody wishes to join another session, please write to me and we'll organize something. Uh, and, and then, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for writing. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I think, so personally what I'm hoping to do is to, you know, for a while just explore and document what I'm seeing and not try to build anything yet for a while. And so I'm happy that you are thinking about building something and maybe I'm more on the side of looking and documenting and hopefully it will be helpful. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll try to keep sharing that namespace, uh, th that uh, namespace with a few exploration examples and, and yeah. So does anybody have any thoughts about where we are, about where we should be going or any concluding thoughts before some people leave? Thomas? So I think I think like for, for me at least the, the goal would be to just uh read like I don't know a chapter or two till next week and then in some way collect my thoughts about them, maybe write some notes or or a short video of what I thought and then and then based on that like reflect like have a look what, what everybody's thoughts were on, on, on those chapters. And I think that could be instructive for uh, how a new library could look like because where are people dripping? What's hard for for people? And I'm also just learning how ggplot actually works. Yeah, I think it just comes down to like everybody works differently, right? Like some people, like I'm I'm off. I'm sort of like you guys. You know, I'll read a book cover to cover before I do anything and like just like stew on it and mull it over. But other people, you know, like I know Tater love to just like jump in and learn by doing it. I think that's great too. And I think. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, it's different ways of coming to the same understanding. And so however, however that works for, for everyone, um, like, yeah, basically, I think it's cool to just do it in public as much as anyone is interested in. Um, but yeah, there's no, there's no like necessarily right or wrong way. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in like continuing to study and like one of the things that I, that I, that I intend to do is like, you know, like write up my thoughts, like on the yeah. actual grammar of graphics book because i think like it's particularly useful because it's not tied to any specific implementation right it's not tied the to thing. the internal details of um vega light um you know it, it's not tied into the internal details of ggplot2 um you know and like you know even though i think ggplot2 is a more faithful representation of the core concepts in the grammar of graphics book like you know if we're being ambitious right we could look at the book and be like what could closure sure. do better than r um because i think i yeah. think it can uh, i think it can um and totally. uh and that's 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 so for me that's what i'm interested in focusing on is is looking at the ideas and seeing how uh you know a different distillation of the concepts would make sense for the for the closure you know data ecosystem maybe it sounds like there's a lot of people like it might be really cool if you know, we had like a little collection of blog posts or or whatever, however people are are thinking of sharing all these ideas, like, because I think it's, it's always helpful to read how other people are understanding something, because it kind of can like, for me anyway, it helps me like, like, are we thinking about this the same way? Like, am I getting it the way I think I'm getting it? Um, so anyway, I think it'd be super cool to keep in touch, whether it's through like synchronous meetings like this, or just on the Slack, like, if you guys end up if you like read a chapter and write a blog post about it, or start up a little demo repo, just playing around, like, it'd be cool to collect all of that kind of in like one place, I think, and share it. And we can all kind of like, like see how it's, how it's going. Cause yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like, it's nothing revolutionary. Like it's actually very elegant and, and simple I find, but it's like, it's just a lot to take in and it's a big project. And so, um, I don't know. I feel like the more, the more ways of explaining and, and understandings that are out there, the better. Maybe two short comments. So one, um, I think it is very interesting to look into Hanami. Hanami yeah. is the general idea of expressing 
defaults and some logic around defaults as data. So it, it is something like the, the Lambda calculus in closure maps. It is a way to specify how you, you propagate your defaults through your data to generate your data visualization specifications. And it is an alternative to ggplot that actually has a lot of logic in those, in those many functions. So I think it, it is insightful to just, just see Hanami and read some of the discussions around it in Zulip. And the other comment is that many of the discussions around this are in Zulip, and at least three of the relevant people yeah. who are not here today are there over the, 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 the chat, in Zulip chat, including uh, 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 John Anthony, the Hanami author. So maybe it would be great to keep chatting about it there, I believe. Yeah, that's a good point. If maybe if if anyone here is not on the Zula, it seems to be more active than the Slack for this kind of topic. Um, yeah, and yeah, I love I like Hanami. Like, oh, anyway, I can talk about this stuff forever. But the problem I find with Hanami is like, because I think this isn't also in like the intro chapter of the book. Um, Andrew, it's like, you know, they talk about getting away from like a collection of specifications for specific charts towards like a generic grammar as in like a language and it's it's just a different way of thinking about graphing but I think the thing that from Hanami that's really useful that we that we should hang on to is the defaults because it's like yeah you can set all of these very sensible defaults all the way down and then use Spectre or whatever library to like meta merge them all the way up so that you end up with these really like terse like brief um gra like graphic descriptions or whatever but um yeah, the pro I find the the current just the current implementation leads to this like proliferation of like chart templates, which is like kind of what we're trying to get away from, because um, it's just there's there's an infinite number of possible distinct chart specifications, and so whilst it's cool and useful, and I can totally see where John is coming from, like if you're in a in a niche domain, like if you're like a biochemist or if you're a physicist, there might only be like four types of charts that you ever make, and so you have your library of charts. And you just use those and it works great for that. But for kind of the more like generic, like data analysis, data exploration type user, which is I think more common in the, the world of like data science, um, it can be like limiting because you end up with this very bespoke set of chart templates. And then they can be like a little bit cumbersome to, to change and edit. And if you want something that's not one of those, you really have to know the fundamentals and like the internals of bag of light anyway. And so it's like, what do I need this library for? Um, but it is super cool. It's a it's a really cool idea, and I really like the idea of of um, that's the thing. Yeah. So you 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 have this higher level grammar instead of these like chart layouts. Basically, um, is is the goal. But anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm rambling. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. We are now around the official time. Maybe somebody need to leave needs to leave. Does anybody wish to say anything before we stop recording? I kind of just in general really uh uh fond of uh when you're kind of closing a meeting what is the kind of next next unknown uh and for me I'd I'd love to kind of start thinking about operations and types because that's how I would approach uh trying to model this enclosure but where I'm stuck is that I don't know uh ggplot2 and, and the grammar of graphics so uh, I'd either need to learn that myself or work with someone who uh who is familiar with that or more familiar with that than i'm great yeah so uh, we'll keep chatting offline i think and a few of us will now stay after the recording so uh so nice to meet again everybody and and uh really a pleasure and we will now say goodbye to the recording uh, to our friends listening to the recording, we just say that uh, the interesting part begins now when we're not recording, that's the best part. And also that uh, there is a new study group coming, the Closure Real World Data Study Group, where people will share their own data problems, data projects in, in a shared space, meet bi-weekly. And uh, finally, it is happening after a long delay. So if anybody is interested, then uh, please uh, let us uh, chat about it. 
So now we'll say goodbye to the recording and see you on the next time.